welcome for folks. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, which is, to our knowledge, the only entirely volunteer-run Dharma Center, at least in San Francisco, maybe the United States. Um, and by that, we mean this isn't run by teachers. This isn't run by a large organization. Truly, everything here happens um, from the board who are volunteers and the volunteers who show up here. Some who, of whom are here tonight. Will you all raise your hands online and in person? I mean, what an awesome community. So I'm Eve Ekman. I have um, the great pleasure to be one of the teachers here. And in our, in our gathering here, our, our goal is that folks can really come together and practice the Dharma and sit, discuss, reflect. And, you know, it's interesting in the, in the book we've been following, just such an important point is not, not taking anything that we read or talk about at face value, but to find a way to integrate it into your life and to make it yours. Um, and it's so inspiring that we've been reading the historical life of the Buddha, because of course, you know, he didn't learn Buddhism, right? He discovered these teachings through close observation of his life. And that's what we all do here, closely observe our life and figure out how we can take our insights and make them feel transformative, right? So that we shift not only our ability to calm our mind and open our heart, if that wasn't enough, but our worldview, right? Because calming our mind, training our mind and opening our heart is so essential. And in some ways, it's also, you know, addressing a lot of the symptoms that many of us are facing, whether that's anxiety or overwhelm or loneliness or distress, but it's the worldview shift that really gets beneath often the very root of what is um, hard for us. And tonight we get, uh, it's just last, last time we were in the book, it was Four Noble Truths. So it's like literally mega hits in these next couple chapters. So Four Noble Truths, like kind of a big deal tonight, five aggregates. It's like, wow. And Buddha is just teaching these now um, as he starts to bring in his very first disciples. So that's where we are in the historic life of the Buddha. And um, for our time together tonight, we'll start with a meditation. Then I will share a bit from this book. And for folks who are new, this is a beautiful book. It's a compilation of historic ideas and stories about the Buddha um, that was compiled by the late great Thich Nhat Hanh. And it is such a beautiful collection of stories. And we're getting to the interesting part in the book where some of the chapters are like three pages and some of the chapters are 12. And what I understand from how this book was put together is that reflects the kind of shreds of stories. So some of the stories that Thich Nhat Hanh found were truly like long stories about, you know, and then the Buddha did this in this amazing village. And some are like, and then the Buddha just helped another person wake up, moving on. <laughs> so they like really change chapter to chapter. Um, I have to warn you, I had it accidentally my first espresso in like six months at noon. But I'm like, oh, hey. So um, I'm going to do my best, but I'm in a bit of an altered state, but it's really exciting that I don't feel tired. That's kind of the only bonus on that. Um, and we might get to the five precepts tonight. And so it was interesting looking at, you know, any substance or intoxicant that occludes the mind. And I was like, oh, this counts. Um, it is such a, a whole bodily feeling. And I used to be a coffee drinker, but when you get off it, it is, yeah, it's really powerful. So well, that's my, that's my, my slight warning. Um, the first practice we're going to do tonight is working with identifying and actually identifying and then releasing our thoughts in meditation, kind of what we often and always are doing. But what I'd love you to take a moment to do before we start is really consider how do you usually react to your thoughts when you're meditating? So we're going to take just a moment to kind of do a little pre-meditation before we get into the practice. So just turning your gaze inward. And taking one long, deep breath that invites you fully into the body. 
matching it with a long exhale. Doing that maybe two more times. So lengthening and extending the inhale, maybe noticing the belly rise, that full breath. And as we exhale, gently pulling the belly button towards the spine and releasing the breath. And for maybe three minutes, we're gonna to continue to follow the breath, but no longer lengthening, just coming into the natural rhythm of the breath. And whenever a thought arises, see if you can notice the thought arising, and especially notice your reaction to the thought arising. So again, following the breath with your attention and noticing when the thought arises and your reaction to it. So just a little preview, curious, what, what did you notice when your thoughts arose, when you got carried away from the breath? What was your thought about that feeling, thought about your thought or feeling about the thought? Yeah, I'll, I can repeat it, it's, or you can do it, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I'm paying attention, my thoughts are more like, a lot of times they, they start out as more like pre-thoughts, mm. like something that's, that's coming up that seems like it's going to be a thought. And then I think about that. So, hmm. um, uh, they, they want to multiply. Yes. Proliferate is the word often used. Yeah. So the pre-thought and then the kind of more thoughts. And then when you remember to go back to the breath, is there like an attitude? But sometimes, sometimes there's a, a little irritation is, yeah. is, is the place where I'm at now. Yep. I've had a lot more attitude about it in the past. Yeah. But where there, there can be a light, a mild irritation, or there can be total acceptance and just, oh, there it is. There it is, right. Yeah. And when the irritation arises, is it in the body, mind? It's it, it's in the mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I answered that a little too quick. <laughs> we will have time to explore. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Not a, there's not a wrong answer. It's more like, what do we notice when our thoughts arise? And, you know, Generally, the instruction is to follow the breath. So when the thought arises, there can sometimes be, yeah, a feeling about that. Anybody else notice when the thought arose, like what came up? Yes. Sometimes I can repeat it if you prefer not to, either way. Okay, thank you. Sometimes when I'm noticing the thought and I'm being mindful and then I catch myself thinking, I'm already thinking 
that I'm noticing that oh, that. So it's like I feel like I unavoidably I get into a trap. Yes. Yes. yes, exactly. How does the trap feel? Sometimes it does feel like um, the same word, like irritated, but yep. to the body, like I, like I got to move or something. Totally. Yep. Great. Yeah. Did anybody online write in the chat or answer? Oh, I think I see Sylvia. Is that maybe wanting to share behind there? Hi, hi everybody. Hi, Eve. Hi. Hi. Uh, what I what I noticed now that you asked was that when the thought immediately when I noticed the thought, the next thing was an emotional reaction. But right away, like yeah. I would think something and I would say, wow, why? or mm, I don't like that, like yeah. immediately. And yes. um, I, had, I, I guess I, I hadn't noticed how, how easily it was for the thought to in, create that so like spontaneously. And so yeah. it's like a thought that's already, you know, like woven with something else and then it just spins and spins. Yes, very beautifully described. Thank you. And yeah, and I think part of what, you know, I hope this kind of pre-practice helps us see is, you know, the thoughts or the mental formations in and of themselves, you know, they're inevitable. They're going to come. Yet it's this, our stance towards it, right? It's that clinging on to it. And as we'll see in the reading tonight, it's attributed to the source of all of our suffering. Not the thought. Thoughts are like, I don't know about y'all, but my thoughts are not that exciting generally. Um, as my teacher often says, it's like, you know, you, you, it's a ripoff. You're going to see the same show, but all the time, same stuff, and you're paying the entry fee of your attention. Um, and so, again, not necessarily a problem, but like, you know, I loved, you know, you know, describing the kind of tightening in the body and the frustration. Or even with our thoughts, we realize there's like an attitude about it. Does this resonate for folks? Can they recognize that a little? Like it's not just the thought, but yes, no. <clears throat> I uh, had a funny thing come up just now that was like the opposite of that, where sometimes, probably not just me, but you're in your thoughts for a really long time mm -hmm. before you realize you're in them. And this time when I realized it, I just like cracked up because I was like, oh, that means I'm no longer in it if I realize it. Yeah. So it was this really kind of cool moment of like, yes, yes I'm not thinking. I mean, I'm thinking about the fact that yeah. I was thinking, but yeah. I was unable to come back. So that was yeah. the, kind of the other side of it. And so when you notice like, oh, I'm aware I'm thinking because I've noticed this, then you were able to come back to the breath and it was yeah. like refreshed or? Yeah, well, I was really amused. Normally I just come back. I, I, I don't. I don't usually have um, a huge attitude about having had thoughts mm -hmm. during meditation, yeah. but this time I just found it hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And probably some of you know this study, I think it came out, yeah, 2011 now. It's like one of the first studies using what's called ecological momentary assessment or like asking you a lot throughout the day and it made headlines everywhere because we discovered that people are essentially not thinking about what they're doing at least 47 percent of the time right so you're doing something but actually your mind is somewhere else so it's not just when we meditate right not just when we meditate meditation is a great time for us to learn you know and familiarize what it's like to notice ourselves and to also kind of notice this attitude we have that it should be different. Um, and generally when we're throughout our day, not focusing on what we're doing, we kind of like, oh, right, so here I am. But maybe there's a little less of an attitude. I think with meditation, we have this expectation it should be different. Um, and yet I think meditation is such an incredible place to train that meta awareness that ability to recognize our thoughts and feelings as they have caught us and, you know, proliferated or as we've been in a long going kind of train of thoughts, like sometimes on retreat, when my mind actually gets calm enough, 
I feel like I catch, you know, I think of it as like a series of, you know, train cars. So sometimes I'll catch like the third car in the train. I never catch the steam engine, like that first thing that gets the thought going. And then if it's been, you know, a full day or I'm stressed, I usually catch the caboose, you know, it's like 20 thoughts in. And then if you actually play it back, it's like, how did I think about like, lunch during fourth grade and tater tots like how did it where did we you know and you go back and it's like oh yeah I heard that bell outside and then it reminded me of recess and I was like when did a recess oh lunch you know it's like wow right and here we are when we catch ourselves and none of this actually needs to be a, a problem at all and in the next practice we're going to do, I'm going to invite us to really treat this observation of our thoughts like a practice of deep relaxation and letting go. So we'll use a kind of um, classic way of imagining a nice metaphor for imagining thoughts, which is imagining them like clouds passing by. But the invitation is going to be as we kind of recognize this cloud to really have it give us a signal of, can I relax even deeper? Because the way that we can train and stabilize our attention is not through tightening up and getting frustrated with ourselves. It actually is through deeper relaxation. Like that's how we train the stable awareness that we want to discover <clears throat> that exists in between thoughts. Hmm. I'll say that one more time, right? By relaxing when we notice a thought, we're helping ourselves kind of like lean back in the mind into that greater, vaster awareness that exists in between and amid our thoughts, right? I think, you know, Buddhism 101 is you are not your thoughts. And then 201, 301, 401, whatever it would be is, well, what am I, right? Or what is there? And getting that glimpse of some sense of consciousness, awareness, whatever word you want to use that is between thoughts, around thoughts, behind thoughts. Again, it doesn't actually matter the metaphor as long as you can resonate with there is a spaciousness that is not my thoughts. There is something that is aware and conscious that is not thoughts. So we're looking for like little glimpses of that. Again, with the train metaphor, you know, when the train's going by and you just get those little glimpses of sky in between the cars. It's like, even if you have that really long train of thoughts, there's still going to be those glimpses. But if we're, if we tighten up, <clears throat> we're often proliferating more thoughts, we're making it actually harder. So the thought comes, and I will be instructing us over and over, deeply relax when you notice a thought, deeply let go when you notice a thought. It's just a counter training. Hey, Eve. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Eve, I'm here online. I just wanted to say we have a couple comments in the in the chat that I wanted Great. to read. Uh, Thank you, Jason. Um, Claudia said I had a very pleasant reaction, very pleasant reactions, relaxing. So that I wanted to share. And Claudia, you had your hand up too. So if you want to comment. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I just actually I wanted to ask uh, Eve because I, I was imagining a very healing scene, but all yeah. of a sudden, but all of a sudden, it, it, like I was in the ocean, okay, and all of a sudden, the 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 sea turned kind of violent, mm. and I I rejected that, and mm. I, so I don't know if that's okay, and and all of a sudden I thought about like some meetings with a couple of people where I noticed some very positive changes in attitude and I had a very pleasant time. And so then that was very relaxing, but I don't know if it's okay when I notice the negative one, obviously my, the thought came in, right? Yeah. And I said, no, I don't want that. And so I decided that I wanted something positive. Yeah. Yeah. I think there there's, there's never a not okay. Um, and I think, you know, even with my instruction, always it's your practice. But I, what I'm trying to describe here this evening is really having a lighter relationship with our thoughts, not denying them and also not kind of preferring the ones we like. Yeah, like the nice ones are really nice. I mean, you guys, I had 
all time one of the best pastries of my life today. Uh, I can think about that all night. It was so good. It was a cinnamon mm -hmm. bun. We can talk about it later if you want. But like I could literally go back to that and create like this enjoyable savoring in my mind. Yet that wouldn't help me train my greater awareness. It would help me in the moment stimulate joy. Really important. Really great to have that as when sometimes called like a positive distraction. Really great if we're in acute pain. Really great if we're in like, you know, pain, physical or emotional, just somewhere to go and land our mind. In this practice, we are trying to um, not engage with the thought by either pushing away or so perfect example, Claudia. Thanks. And, and there's actually one more, which totally segues, um, which Great. Maria said, which is, I noticed as thoughts arise, there's a whole coinciding analysis and decision making process about what I want to follow or not. Yes. Now we're getting into the aggregates. Perfect. Yeah. It's not just our thoughts, but then how we you know, cling on to or organize or prefer the thoughts, mm -hmm. right? And if, especially if we think of these different aspects or ways of receiving information through the world from, from seeing, from hearing, from smelling, from thoughts, right? And again, all of it, not a problem. It's our judgment around it or our preference towards it that can make us again, just get kind of like completely fused with our experience, missing this larger view. Um, so great reflections. Are we ready for a practice? Okay, deep relaxation, clouds. We'll, we'll get into that just a bit through some settling into the body and speech and mind. So for posture, um, especially for folks, maybe it's your first time here, Maybe if we're really lucky, it's your first time meditating. Um, you want to find a posture that you can comfortably hold for the next 20 or 25 minutes. If that's cross-legged, wonderful. Um, if it's not, having your feet on the ground, so not having your legs crossed is great. And when you notice your posture, really finding a posture that feels unique to this practice. I love this analogy of imagining as though we were sitting on our throne of practice, like that level of dignity with our experience of practice. And when we're sitting on a throne, we're not slumping, right? We're not leaning forward. We have this natural uprightness of the spine. And this is not just for formality, right? If you look at the kind of subtle body um, channels that have been studied for thousands of years through contemplative practice, this allows this kind of central channel in our body to have the potential to be open, which allows you know, our kind of busy mind to drop down. And so finding that sense of the upright spine and finding a posture in which you can find or feel that your shoulders are not hiked up to your ears and that your hands are resting either kind of flat on your lap or folded in a way that also allows your neck and shoulders to feel at ease. And feeling or imagining a slight upward tilt of the heart. And with your head rested gently on top of the neck, and soften and soften and soften through the forehead, between the brows, especially and deeply through the eyes. And through the cheekbones and the jaw. And just as we feel that dignity and uprightness of the spine, we feel a softening and an ease through the front of the body. If it feels safe and comfortable, you can have your eyes closed. Otherwise, they can be just slightly open with a soft gaze.
Let's reestablish our attention and awareness in the body through the breath once again. So lengthening our inhale, slowly drawing the breath in through the nostrils and allowing the belly to push out gently. And gently releasing as the belly deflates, maybe the belly button even comes a little back towards the spine. And following the natural slowed rhythm of your breath, again, lengthening the inhale and gently pressing the stomach out. And then exhaling, finding the stomach moving back towards the spine. Continuing for three more lengthened inhales and lengthened exhales. At the end of your next exhale, returning to the natural rhythm of your breath. Now bringing your attention and awareness to the entire body. Allow this attention and awareness to be within the body. Not looking down upon the body, but noticing the sensations or tactile experiences throughout the body. This could be noticing areas of relative warmth or coolness, maybe areas of heaviness or tingling. This could also be sensations of energy flowing in the body. We'll stay here for a little while, just attuning and noticing sensations throughout the body as they may shift and change, and some that stay more steady. And then for a couple breaths, instead of noticing different areas in the body of sensation, feel and notice the entire body breathing in, the entire body breathing out.
shifting and narrowing our focus. Bring your attention and awareness to the belly rising and the belly falling with each breath. Shifting and narrowing one more time. Each time we narrow, we give the mind something a little more precise, may help us settle a bit more. Notice the subtle sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. Maybe feeling the coolness of air as it travels in and relative warmth as it travels out. And now that we may have settled a bit, the body, speech, and mind, consider an intention or aspiration for this practice. This can be something that feels aligned with where you are today, a quality you want to support or energize. This could be a broader or greater value that you're bringing to the path. Our intention is said to be the most important part of our practice, really infusing meaning into whatever happens next. We're just taking a couple moments here and finding an intention that feels very resonant. Feeling this intention radiate through the body as though infusing the body with this light and inspiration. And then as we move into the next part of practice, choose an anchor. The anchor could be the whole body breathing. The anchor could be the belly rising and falling or the sensations of breath at the nostrils. The anchor is our safe harbor where we will put our primary attention. It's where we return every time we notice a thought. So whichever of those three types of noticing and bringing mindfulness to our breath felt most resonant for you, Bring that anchor to the forefront of your attention. And when you notice a cloud of thought coming, or you catch yourself midway or deep in the cloud, deeply relax, could even consider internally saying, letting go. And then coming back to the anchor.
primarily focused in our anchor, paying attention to the breath. Then as though we are leaning back in the mind, awaiting the next thought that comes by, seeing it like a cloud without substance or form, relaxing, releasing, letting go, and coming back to the breath. Even if we feel totally swept away on that full thought train. And even if we feel frustrated or tight about it, right in that moment of noticing, release, let go, feel the softness of just gently returning to the breath. If the thoughts are like clouds, there were such beautiful clouds in the sky today. We can also imagine or feel into the spaciousness or blueness of the sky behind the clouds. We could practice or play with the idea of being in that spaciousness or the blue sky means letting go a bit of our anchor, letting the anchor be the spaciousness between the clouds. If that feels abstract or confusing, no problem. Stay with the anchor of the breath.
Take a moment and notice how the body feels. Reinstantiating part of our presence and awareness in the body. And feeling the spaciousness of awareness through our entire body. And feel or imagine that leaning back in the mind. Allowing the clouds to pass through, relaxing and releasing, letting go every time we notice a thought. Gently returning our full attention and awareness now to the body. And following the next breath entirely through its cycle of inhale and exhale. And feeling a sense of this moment this room, this gathering of beings. Feeling a sense of the ground beneath us, the space around us, the setting sun outside. And gently remembering your intention Just because the bell rang doesn't mean the practice is over. Don't feel like you need to totally come out of that presence with body, noticing of the mind. Any thoughts, reflections, questions, insights? Did that feel a little different than the usual way? One responds to thoughts coming during a mindfulness of breathing practice. I think I see a chat or hand somewhere. Anybody still in the clouds? <laughs> I actually had a challenging time with this one. Okay. I feel like um, they wouldn't, it wouldn't stop. Like mm -hmm. I felt it was just like one cloud that I was in and they would sort of dance around in there, but I couldn't break it. Yeah. And so. how, how did it feel to be with that? Or what was your response? Oh, um, I think I was okay with it. Yeah. Actually, I was like, well, this, this is just how it is. Yes. And, um, but then towards the end, finally, I was able to be like, oh, I think it stopped. And I had like a moment of clarity. And was being like um, gentle with it, kind of relaxing and 
um, letting go, did that, was that able to feel some ease, even though it felt pretty steady? Yeah, no, that, that was helpful. And it, and I was pretty relaxed. Like I felt like my body was really relaxed. And so it didn't disturb me too often. Yeah. I, there was like a slight wish of like, baby, I'm not a good meditator, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Um, kind of feeling that yeah. came, but yeah. uh, also it was just like, I know it's not like that all the time. Um, beautiful. So I was going to be my next question is, do you notice that there's sometimes when that isn't the case? Yes. Yeah. There are yeah. Times. And I think it's really, I mean, I joke about this a lot, but like the worst thing that can happen to you is a good meditation practice. Cause then you're like, Oh, I wanted to be like that again. Like yeah. that's good. The rest of this, ugh, <laughs> this is, this sucks. Right. Like yeah. I had my perfect pastry today and now like, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yes. I sometimes find it a little weird when I have a preconception about how I'm meant to respond to my thoughts. Mm. So that becomes a thought. So I'm like, oh, thoughts are clouds. Let me picture some clouds. <laughs> or, oh, there's a thought. That's a cloud. Let me like make the little bumps around it like you would when you're drawing it. <laughs> you know yeah. sort of like a meta thought yeah which is still a thought <laughs> yes so observing a lack of thoughts like i'm picturing the scene of clouds maybe i'm picturing the blue sky yeah still a thought and then i'm like oh oh no that's a thought yeah yeah so what was it like what was it like for you in the practice i feel like i noticed one uh, i mean i found it kind of difficult for that yeah. reason yeah because i kept thinking about clouds and stuff but, but also there was one point when I was like, this always happens to me. I'm like, oh, I've gotten so many breaths without thinking. Mm. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I just did it. Yeah. But that's great. And when you were in the breaths, do you like, what did it feel like? Or do you remember how that experience was? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think if I, rem if I was thinking about how it felt that I'm thinking again, and it's it's so a little confusing. It is. And what gets confusing about it in such a good way, and thank you for that, like, very apt description is there's thinking, and then there's like awareness, and then there's like knowing, right? And often this is described, like Sokni Rinpoche and, and his brother Minjur, like talk about a lot of these different kinds of awareness we can have. And I'd say that the thinking that is non-volitional, like whatever is just coming to mind. And then the cloud is like, oh, I'm going to think about it like a cloud, right? So we're directing it. And then there's like, just like a knowing that's more like our, our unconfigured awareness where we're not directing it anywhere. It's so hard because we're using concepts to point out the non-conceptual. Right. Yet, I still think no matter what, like, and, and this, you know, I learned it from my root teacher, Alan Wallace, and I found it to be true. There's, he always says the way to find like the, the calm mind that allows that spacious awareness is what he calls existential relaxation. Like it's like an unwinding. We got to start with our bodies um, to do that. But I think that it's like this ease. And it's funny because I've asked a similar question to one of my teachers. I'm like, well, if I'm thinking about this, you know, then I'm, you know, is that supporting my practice or am I like adding to the proliferation? And again, it's that like, you know, we're, it's like we're using the same tools to like uh, dissemble the um, thing that we want, like that is the thing we want to get rid of. Um, but I think noticing and really tuning into the body's experience of it, that can help that more unconfigured experience to arise. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A great question. Anybody else? I have a, a chat that I can share. Um, great, thank you. Sylvia says, um, I found it incredibly calming when I noticed a thought. Instead of judging, I said to myself, relax more. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at least for me, what I notice is when that, when I can, because it's interesting, you know, also, of course, in many Vajrayana practices, like Lopan Chandra teaches here, we use visualization 
to clear our mind. We're like what? <laughs> like we're using these very or, ornate images, right? To then create the, the potential for having calmness and spaciousness. But I notice when I can actually like lean back in the mind that I feel calm from the back of my head, like all the way down my body. Um, there's like this, yeah, it's, um, and I don't, know if it's similar for everyone, but I, I feel confident that for a lot of us, we'll be able to start noticing it through our body, that level of relaxation, and then the mind kind of follows suit. Trying to start with the mind, like relax the mind, relax the mind, it's really, really tough. But giving ourselves that simple instruction, that gentle instruction with our thoughts is a way to be at ease. And just so interesting, even in our pre-practice in describing how we respond to our thoughts, there was like a lot of the clenching, right? And so undoing that. Um, yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Oh, yes, Claudia. Sorry again, but I, I can't help it. I just, I noticed that you said that the space in between thoughts is our consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Right, you said that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember exactly, but did you ask us to set our intentions precisely when we were in that, in between those thoughts? Because I'm just wondering, uh, I guess, I, I, I wonder whether if we set our intentions in that space, in that spaciousness, if it's mm. something, it's if something where we're kind of rewiring, if you want, our <laughs> neurons, I guess I'm just, I don't know. But uh, I love that idea. I, I said I was kind of getting us more settled into the into the body and and then doing intention. Um, mm. That could that could be you know, also a place of more spacious openness. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it makes sense to at least what I've noticed in my own practice. If I go to intention quickly, it's very cognitive mm -hmm. and it's very like surface, what's very at the top. Mm -hmm. Doing the intention once we're a little more settled, I, I feel like can be a bit more, um, go a little deeper. I, I felt it more like heartfelt. Yeah, heartfelt. beautiful. I mean, it was, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Yeah. Yes, great. So I noticed there's this kind of fine line between the deep relaxation and then kind of over relaxation mm -hmm. where of losing. And it's kind of that, 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 you know, I'm coming in and out of that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Should try espresso. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, but can I ask you? Sorry, can I ask you another question? Um, and when um, when you notice that, like, so you know, often this is described as dullness, right? And um, when you notice the kind of the relaxation that is more dull, um, what's the shift? How do you notice? The I, I, I notice because. Um, there's a lack of concentration or a lack of focus. Right. Yeah. And is there anything you do just kind of um, intuitively or, or through your practice that like what helps you return? Actually, now that you've said that, now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Open my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I always forget. That's yeah. <laughs> Opening the eyes can help. Focusing on the inhale can help so when we exhale we're naturally relaxing and the inhale kind of can give us that vividness and so opposite like if you're like me and you had your first espresso in six months i had to really focus on the exhale because my mind was like -da 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 -da. So the, right and so it's really nice to have that um and it's really developing that that first person introspection to our experience of am i dull am i too bright and then applying our own remedy. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and then you can have the like amazing hypnagogic dreamlike states when we're really tired, which again, I've said this before here, like I think those are pretty cool. They're not exactly mind training, but it is interesting. I think, I hope we all consider ourselves explorers of consciousness in general. And it's so interesting, those states, right? And um Often, and I've heard Andrew Holacek say this, who, who's written quite a lot on dream yoga, 
um, you know, let yourself fall asleep for a little while. That's usually 30 to 90 seconds and come back refreshed. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. And then on the back. That's actually sleep. kind of what happened to me. I, I, I haven't gotten that sleepy in a meditation in like a very long time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it felt great. <laughs> Good. And I did kind of go into that dream area. Yeah. But I did. I opened my eyes to kind of bring myself out of it. And I kind of changed my posture a bit. Yeah. But that leaning into the relaxation when those thoughts are passing put me into that. Yep. Really, really sleepy state. That's great. Well, it's great to know that as a practice for when you can't sleep. Yeah. And, you know, and then... You know, I do think I've said this many times, but for many of us, r relaxation means like completely falling asleep. And such a key aspect of shamatha and training attention is relaxation with clarity. Mm -hmm. And when you came back, was there a bit more clarity? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, I just, I kind of got a little, I, I noticed I was getting sort of lost in my thoughts and then I realized I was thinking and breathe, but it, I just, it, I kept relaxing and relaxing and mm. relaxing to the point where I was kind of like losing it. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad you both brought that up. Yeah, it is. I think if I hadn't again, had this espresso, I probably would have cued that um, because I think you know, the, the falling into dullness is the hazard, right. Of finding the relaxation and, and getting that balance. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's also, you know, almost eight o'clock seven, like it's hard meditating at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, I was pretty stressed out the last few days, so I didn't think that I would be able to meditate even, but then when I was like listening, I was getting lost and I was sleeping, I was keep doing this. <laughs> and then suddenly like something like through my body, it just like, like went up mm. and then I became like really awake, but then I get like really total relaxation and then kind of detached from everything else yeah. was going on but yeah. then I was aware and it is so clear <laughs> so beautifully described and and that I think you know it's interesting because there's true fatigue right which mm -hmm. a lot of us experience and then there's like the emotional mental fatigue mm -hmm. and practice can actually help us I want I don't want to say push through like no but helps like pierce that level and then we find this kind of more wellspring of our, our deeper energy. Right. And, and it is, it's like, Oh, like I thought I was totally depleted, but it's like, you get through the muck kind of, yeah. and there's, yeah, beautiful, wonderful. Yeah. And, and again, if that didn't happen to you, no problem, but it's nice to know. Um, I mean, that can be, I think that can be applied in a way that's not wholesome. Sometimes I unnamed meditation teacher would say, you know, like, um, to some of his students when they were tired, he'd say, ah, tired is a mental state. Like practice through, you know, and I think like, ah, like kind of get it. And also like rest, like we need actual rest. Um, but it is interesting when we can find that other energy. I find that a lot when I practice that I think I'm so tired. And then I'm like, oh, wow, there's this other energy store. So great. Ulysses, did you have a, yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, well, it's really it's such a joy to hear people's responses. And I, I hope like, you know, people are asking each other's questions and it's, it's just so important, like to have our practice, have that benefit. Some folks know I, I get an opportunity to work in, in different types of meditation and meditation that's assisted through technology and remote and also amazing but you don't get this kind of interaction this sangha of like hearing like yeah other people struggle or wow like they had this cool experience and um it's not just q a I, I remember when i used to sit with this teacher in the mission who lovely teacher um howie cohen some of you may know him and whenever he did q a i was like oh where's the door like <laughs> i didn't come here to listen to q a i came here for like the dharma so um, I, I hope you can feel like the richness of that. So Buddha, for those of you who've been following along, I'll just give you a tiny recap. 
after nine years of seeking other teachings and then being on his own to apply those teachings to his experience, the Buddha achieves awakening under the Bodhi tree. <clears throat> and his first thing is to go find his five friends who had been practicing with him. Um, once he finds them, he starts describing this path of awakening. And the first thing he describes is <clears throat> this kind of middle way. The path I have discovered is the capacity uh, sorry, is the middle way, which avoids both extremes and has the capacity to lead one to understanding, liberation, and peace. And so this idea that um, the extremes being pure austerity, like trying to achieve the apex of your enlightenment by withdrawing from the sensory world, and the other extreme, which is just indulging in all your senses. And then he talks about the Four Noble Truths, which we I went I had the good fortune to go in with uh, with Tig here last time, right? And that you know there is suffering, causes of suffering. There is a path away from suffering, and that there is you know these amazing teachings that help us get through. Um, I think the we didn't spend as much time on the fourth noble truth, um, but I'll just say here, the fourth noble truth is the path which leads to the cessation of suffering. It is the noble eightfold path. It is nourished by living mindfully. Living mindfully leads to concentration and understanding, which liberates you from every pain and sorrow and leads to peace and joy. I'll guide you along this path to realization. Um, and it's, you know, this, this happens a lot in the coming chapters where he gives a simple teaching like that. And then one of his friends, um, in this case, Kadana suddenly felt a great light shining within his own heart. He could taste the liberation he had sought for so long. He beamed with joy. The Buddha pointed at him and cried, you've got it. I can't wait till I can do that. I want to do that. <laughs> You know, but I actually I've had that feeling where you read a teaching or hear a teaching and it's like a great light shining in your own heart and you can like taste liberation. You're like, oh, like that's not just words like I, I know the way from there. Um, so I love that description. <clears throat> um, and then. Do, 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 do. Yeah. And then. He starts instructing them on practicing every day. And then he he taught them, he says, he taught them the impermanent and non-self nature of all things. He taught them to look at the five aggregates as constantly flowing rivers, which contained nothing that could be called separate or permanent. The five aggregates are body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. By meditating on the five aggregates within themselves, they came to see the intimate and wondrous, wondrous connection between themselves and all in the universe. This is what, you know, these practicing on the five aggregates is what allowed them to um, attain liberation. It was first um, Kadana, that one who had the light in his heart, and then two months later, Vapa, and then Badia, and then uh, Mahanamna and Asaji. So they all, you know, with this close attention of the Buddha. But I wanted us to spend a little time on the five aggregates. Um, some people know them as the five skandhas. And it's, um, I feel like it's part of the teaching myself. Like I have heard so many times, almost to the point that I don't actually listen anymore. Right. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Skandas, I got it. And I wanted us to spend, you know, a little time considering these. Um, so when we think about, um, Sorry, my notes here. When we think about the five aggregates, you know, we, we've started tonight a little bit with, with mental formations. And so, you know, the skandhas, it's really, <clears throat> again, it's not a problem, any of these five aggregates. Sometimes they're actually called heaps of clinging instead of five aggregates, right? And we cling upon them. And the idea is to both release them and allow them to be as they are, and or, especially if you're in the Mahayana tradition, um, see them as empty. So I love the cloud image, the metaphor of the cloud, right? Because it gives that immateriality, 
there's something that's there, but there's no like inherent solid thing with the cloud. So <clears throat> there is form, um, and that's often composed, of course, of the body, um, sensation. So especially the way that we kind of identify our sensations as pleasant or unpleasant. Sometimes that's often really associated with uh, emotion. You often hear people talk about Vedana or feeling tone. There's perception. This is this. I think perception and mental formation um, I find really interesting because it's not just our sensory experience. This is kind of what you were suggesting. What was your name? I'm sorry. Isaac is kind of what Isaac was describing, like not just the sensory experience, but kind of how we label it, like how we get conceptual about our experiences. Um, and then mental formations. I really like the de description of mental formations as our, our karmic activities, right? It's like what we're doing, what we're kind of energizing and endorsing um, our kind of of course, thoughts, but it's also our thoughts that are these habitual patterns and ways of thinking. And then consciousness, which actually holds all the others, all the skandhas, and kind of is the discerning factors. None of these are like bad, right? These are not wrong, like body, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. But it is that like clinging onto or getting stuck within. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious for folks, you know, when you have learned these, you know, about the skandhas, has there been a sense of like that light opening in your heart? If so, like why, or if it just sounds conceptual, like, like I want us to kind of like interrogate the skandhas and this essential questioning of none of them, you know, these are all, um, reasonable parts of our ongoing daily experience and consciousness not to use consciousness twice but it is like our you know our clinging to them that gets so problematic like is there a way that makes sense to you that you see in your life is there yeah like how do we apply uh this actually to our momentary experience to our daily life it's kind of like a pop quiz oh yeah please Okay, so I have a question about this. And the question is, so as I learn about this, my understanding is, is that we're trying to basically avoid a life where we're running to pleasure and running from fear, right? Okay. Yeah. And at the same time, you're still going to eat that cinnamon bun, right? Like you're going to choose for, and I'm going to choose pleasurable experiences, yeah. right? And not, so where is it that we're going to say like, yeah, we're, we're, I'm going to try and make as pleasant a life as possible. Mm. And yet sort of kind of be detached from it, you know? Like that seems a little confusing. Yeah, I always love your questions. Um, don't go away. Um, yeah, like I'm so curious. Um, can you think of a time in which you feel like you have caught yourself like going back to that pleasure thing and finding it unpleasant? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or avoiding that like hard thing and finding that actually like extra unpleasant. It's easier for me to say yes to the first one. Yeah. I think that when, yeah, I guess with like the running from fear, there have been situations where like the avoidance of it yes. becomes more painful than the thing itself. Boom. I mean, and that's like, it's a little bit back to the noble truths there, right? That, you know, the difference between pain and suffering, right? The pain, inevitable. The suffering is that added piece we get from clinging and aversion. Okay. So, so basically, when is it becoming? Clinging. 
if I, I mean, I'm kind of joking about the pastry thing, but if I truly like, that's all I could think about. And I was like, I know I got to go teach, but like, is that bakery still open? Like for real. And, and then I, and then I go get one tomorrow and I'm like, and the pleasure but this stops being pleasurable. Right. And when I fixate on that as yeah. the ongoing enduring source of my well being, right. it's a lot of the ways we distract outward right and it's so tough we live in a world i mean always this is true we see this in in old path white clouds you know like we're about to run into like literally a hundred and then a thousand like young men in the forest who are like overly entertained these are like the wealthy sons of brahmins and merchants and they're like so disgusted with the excesses of stimulation and pleasure right and so there is an end to sensory pleasure right that's coming from the outside yet like we feel like like feeling pleasure is not bad or wrong but it is like it's it's such an interesting one to try to find like a wholesome relationship with pleasure right and i think by really examining like how we respond to our body to our pleasant sensations like that's why pulling out the aggregates is like a nice way of seeing all the different ways that we actually kind of reject um, or prefer or like get stuck in that. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think the, I think the thoughts one is really subtle, which is why I wanted us to practice with that first, like, and I didn't even have us, you know, engage in like, which are the thoughts that you're like endorsing and liking. Um, and cause often we'd think, Oh, I want to like Claudia, I want to have these nice thoughts of being with friends, but often the thoughts we actually cling to are like, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. Like those are hard to let go of. And so at the same time though, it's, we are agreeing that from what I'm hearing yeah. that we are going to, on some level, seek pleasure in our lives Absolutely. and avoid pain. Yeah. That's is, that is, we're all going to do that. Yes. Okay. And then I think, again, just like the pith, beautiful wisdom from Pema Chodron, like, you know, who's really calling upon Lojong would be saying, no problem. But like, if you're seeking, like all this pleasure, or trying to avoid the pain, like don't confuse that for a true source of wisdom. And like, do you know, you can go ahead and seek what you believe to be wholesome in your life, but don't get caught up on the outcome. I think that just for me personally, at least speaking about pain, that what thing I'm learning about myself is that with certain kinds of pain, I don't know how, I don't know how to not run from it. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't know how to be with it. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's incredibly honest and real, you know, and I don't think anyone wants to be like, there's no point in forcing. And I often think, you know, depending on the pain, like, let's say the thing <clears throat> that gives me pain is um, thinking about someone who I lost, right? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go there. Like, that is too painful. Like, I can't do that, right? I don't, it's like the kind of not a problem, you know, I'm, I'm avoiding it. It's not necessarily impacting my whole life, but there is part of me that like can't authentically meet pain that has an attitude towards pain. Right. And I think as we kind of, I, I often use this metaphor, but like plant the other seeds <clears throat> where we feel stronger and able to say, like, I feel a sense of intrinsic goodness within me, or I start to have more um, kind of trust in my Dharma or my path. Like maybe slowly I'm willing to open up to these pains, but no forcing. And it's totally okay to find places where we don't want to yet bring that light. But I'd say maybe get curious about, is it possible that at some point I might be able to be with this pain? Well, it's a quandary because even though with these like specific instances, types of pain that I'm referring to, even though maybe I don't, I don't know how to be with them in a skillful way, not like not being with it that leads to its own suffering yeah that's beautiful insight and still no need to force yourself you know and and definitely don't get into some sort of regret or shame about how you should could or would 
I think the clear see, I mean, I can tell you to do that, but like, that's my invitation. Right. And to then if it's like, this is where I am, how kind with yourself can you be with it? It's like that forcing is never going to get the kind of, um, outcome you're looking for. It's that kindness, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the real, but not true mantra of Sokni Rinpoche. So when the pain, when you're like, the pain is there and you're like, this is real. Like I feel a real worry about this pain, but it might not be true. It might not be true that that pain can hurt me now. Mm-hmm. So we start working with, and again, you don't have to like go head on and touch it and be like, I got you. I'm going to like shine my compassion on you. Right. But, you know, just entertaining, like, hmm, maybe I could be at that sometime. And, and the gentleness, it's just such a great practice. Often, you know, I've heard this and read this and didn't believe it. <clears throat> but sometimes that pain self-liberates without your effort. So the softening, the, the kind of, you know, seasoning with compassion all around the pain, the pain then can come to the surface on its own. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Eve, I'd like to just share some thoughts that are running through the the chat, but I, 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 I'm just personally right now I'm fasting because I have to do a medical procedure routine thing, right? Go ahead and fast. So it feels like the sort of forced, forced thing, but it is all, it's really interesting, right? When you stop eating yeah, and then you're like, someone talks cinnamon rolls it's like yeah. and you're trying not to think about them right um, and and also you know how close is the the center to dynamo donuts which is like i work around <laughs> i walk by that place and i am fighting with this overwhelming desire to get donuts you know and mm-hmm. uh, so we're talking about wholesome relationships to pleasure wholesome relationships to donuts and there was marianne put a a very funny quote it's like a whole hole in the middle some relationship with donuts so there's yeah. this whole thing going on about like yeah donuts are one of those cinnamon bun things that are like I, I guess the question is to pose a question how do you practice around these to create a really healthy relationship because pleasure is important like you know what's a wholesome relationship to pleasure? you need to have pleasure i want to have a donut every now and then and I need to know that like, it's not because I'm feeling pain and I'm rushing to cover right. that pain. I'm just like, yeah, this is good. And if I have one, okay. But you know, that I, I, I'm very curious how you uh, establish these practices and then stick to them. Yeah, and thank you, Jason. And I'm sorry to keep bringing up food. Um, I hope the procedure goes well. It's kind of fun, um, actually, because I'm really spinning oh, in a yeah, good way. Oh, fasting is a visionary experience. Yeah, or can be. Um, but I think, you know, especially with food, um, I think it's such a beautiful example of our craving um, and a way that we can get caught up. And when we, you know, are reading, <clears throat> this will come up a lot sooner, in, sorry, in these up to come chapters where um, the Buddha starts to meet these very wealthy merchants and Brahmins and Kings. And they always are inviting him. Like, can I have like a huge banquet for you and your 500 bhikkhus? He doesn't say, no, that's going to be delicious. I'm going to eat these like leftovers that someone put in my begging bowl. Right. He doesn't deny it, but especially, you know, in this first teaching he gives to the children, it's like each section of the tangerine. So it's not about eating or not eating or eating dynamo donuts or eating like a whatever nature Valley granola bar, right? It's not like what you're eating. It's the relationship, the intentionality and the mindfulness with the food that transforms it, which that's awesome. Like is our, our wholesome relationship can be defined by the intention at which we go into it and that we can see through it, right? And feel, I could easily see us using this as like a total free pass to do anything we want, but you know, like, uh, Oh, I'm going to do this intentionally. I'm going to like do everything. Um, and that's why it's, we're not going to get there tonight, but maybe next week, you know, the precepts are interesting. It's another thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Precepts, you know, okay. I won't do the bad things, but this idea of like natural renunciation of what doesn't serve us coming through close observation of our life 
So, you know, not eating a Dynamo donut every day, I assume, Jason, isn't because <clears throat> not only do you not think it's a good idea, like we feel it, like we notice. And as we bring mindfulness to our everyday experience, we actually become way more attuned to what is of service to us and what's in the way. Right. And um, I think that's it's just such an interesting cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, of our mindfulness practice. <clears throat> where we are developing this like more subtle palette, actually pun intended with the food, but the subtle palette for our life. And so what we decide to choose and, and move towards is like naturally infused with the wisdom of our mindfulness, right? It's less like, oh, I shouldn't do that. And more like, oh, I know how that's going to feel. Right. And whether that's being angry at someone and letting it go or like indulging, <clears throat> it's um, yeah, I think it's a really beautiful kind of cycle and hearing how we'll see in these banquets that these kings hold for the Buddha. You know, they're so excited and they like best food ever and they want the Buddha to give the teaching. And yet him and all the bhikkhus come and they eat in total silence which is just so different from like the raucous parties of the kingdoms that he talks about, like an entire meal in silence and then the teaching. So like that's actually part of the teaching, right? Is how we're engaging with what's enjoyable. So yeah, great noticing. Maybe anyone else? We have a couple more. Yeah, Jimmy. <clears throat> I'm going to try to be quick and succinct. Um, the, the thing that I found when I first started coming around this stuff a very, very, very long time ago was that I really was looking for answers one and done. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, you know, this is the teaching about craving. This is the teaching about, about aversion. This is the donut teaching. This is the, you know, and... What you just suggested mm. was that this is a practice, mm. this is a palette and a sensitivity to our mm. experience that develops over time. These are very, very profound ideas. Yeah. And as ideas, they're super, super profound. But as ideas, they're, they're not particularly useful just mm. as ideas. They're very, very useful as practices mm. and over time this stuff starts changing and it starts becoming more and more of a mm. reality yeah and we, it'll be interesting when we do get into the precepts how those become mm. more and more of a reality yeah but over time yeah thank you that's so beautifully said and you know, as you were speaking, I was just feeling and remembering the practices as they start to come alive in our life. And we start to notice like, you know, in, in one of the first, um, you know, wealthy young men that the Buddha meets in the forest, uh, he reminds this young man who feels just, he's like, I'm so tired of sensory pleasure. I have the courtesans all night and all the music and like, oh, I'm disgusted by it. I'm repulsed by it. And the Buddha says, you don't need to be repulsed by sensory experience. Like, look at the leaf. Look at the sunlight. Like, what are you directing your sensory experience towards? Right? And that just, you know, that I know for myself, like this, the shift of how I'm able to appreciate and enjoy um, over the course of my practice has enriched my life. Like, if that was it be enough right just being able to see and appreciate the subtlety of kindness of beauty of like that you know sense of things being in flow like my bike ride here from home I always like really just love like feeling like I'm preparing myself for the dharma you know and like letting the dharma in and it's like the most beautiful thing right my intention is that and and it rises up um yeah, so I think I just love you sharing that, that these ideas, they do take time and it's worth it. And as I, I said to someone the other day who was asking me about meditation, you know, and psychedelics and all these other things, and I said, well, I wish there was a shortcut. And if there was, I would have taken it. 
absolutely all of this stuff take time no matter what doorway in you know it takes time and you know it beats the alternative of in continuing to like strive and be distracted and burnt out and um yeah it's uh it's so precious yeah yeah oh thank you with that how about we dedicate our merit together take an opportunity to come back into the body into the breath I'm taking a couple of moments to just feel anything that may have been stirred or inspired or deepened in our discussion or in our practice tonight. And in our dedication, we get to offer up. We get to both rejoice and savor in any goodness or benefit that we are experiencing or generating. And in that same instant, offer it. You know, taking it in, offering it out, rejoicing and sharing any bounty with the world. And so considering that the kind of embers or sparks or fire of awakening that we are tending together here this evening, that that warmth could be dedicated towards our ongoing aspiration to work towards all beings knowing peace and ease, all beings feeling healthy and strong, all beings knowing the true causes of happiness and finding that happiness, that all beings could be free. <laughs> 